it's great to be here. I think I've met a few of you before um, and the rest. I can say the next time I meet you, I've met you before. Uh, a little bit about our company. Uh, like Mark was saying, we were not in the space business uh, eight years ago. The heart of our, the heart of our business is uh, transmission and gear manufacturing, as well as um, all-terrain amphibious vehicles. Um, our newest division is our space robotics division. And I'll cover, tell you a little bit about those before we move on to the good stuff. Um, overhead shots of our, uh, of, our, of our buildings here. We're in New Hamburg, that's down the road, past Kitchener, hour and a half, depends how fast you drive. Um, we just uh, opened up our, our, our new building for space robotics division. Uh, it's also in town. If you look closely, I don't think I can see my truck, but uh, I can see where I park. And I get sandwiches right there. Good sandwiches there. Uh, in terms of gears, uh, we have a about 100,000 square foot gear shop. Uh, we make uh, gears for customers like Toyota, Mag, uh, Magna. Um, we make some stuff for Jeep, uh, Volvo, uh, a lot of heavy industry. Uh, our gears quality is up to Agma 14. I just don't know what that means, but it's probably better than Agma 13. There's a picture of uh, machines that build gears. I don't really know how they work. Our vehicle division, I'm, this is where I started in at Argo. Um, I'm, a, I'm an off-road enthusiast, so that's kind of what drew me to the company. These are, these are extreme train amphibious vehicles. They're, they're, they're not very fast, but they can actually go over water and they float and they, they're all, all seasons vehicles. You can put tracks on them, uh, as you can see on that, on that vehicle. You can run them all winter, come spring, you take the tracks off and you can go across you know, ponds and small lakes and stuff like that. And we've been doing that for almost 50 years. We celebrate our 50th anniversary for the vehicles in uh, a year and a half, roughly. All of our vehicles are skid steer, I should mention, too. That means to turn it, you simply slow the wheels down on one side, and it turns that way. And the worse the conditions, the better vehicles perform. So we, we have great sales uh, in, in you know, the, the north part of Canada, the extreme parts of South America and Russia, places like that. Our space robotics division started up uh, in about 2008, and since then we've we've done a lot of different things. We we leverage our gear division. Um, we do we do our concept right from concept generation to manufacturing to test. Lots of different projects. I'll cover a few of the more interesting ones. So I'll give you a little background on what we're working on right now, um, and it has to do with the moon. It's been a long time since. Um, humankind has been on the moon. The last time we were there, uh, people dressed like that <laughs> or that. I think they're the same guys. <laughs> and they drove cars that looked like that or that. Um, and the reason we're talking about the moon now is because within the last few years, there's been uh, a couple of space missions. I've gone to the moon and, and uh, they found a lot of water. Now that we haven't we haven't actually gone onto the moon and, and determined it for real, but they uh, they crashed they crashed a, a, a spacecraft into the moon and they analyzed the plume that came up and they are finding up to 10% water in areas uh, looking for a, a hydrogen signature. I didn't have a picture of water on the moon, so I flipped that picture. See, it's water on the moon. Now, the last time we went there was, I think, 1973, 74, 1972, was the, was the end of the Apollo missions. Um, this was a absolutely remarkable um, program. I'm not a Star Trek fan, uh, but I'm a big fan of this one. All I know from Star Trek is the Nanu Nanu. Am I doing that right? No. I mean, the force be with you, that's it, right? No. Nothing. <laughs> Shoot. Tough crowd, tough crowd. But, but this thing was real. <laughs> uh, that thing was higher than a Canadian football field is long, uh, weighed like six million pounds. Um, they had to create custom equipment just to move the thing around and to set it up. They created a superhuman, no, that's, I made that up. But it's, uh, that's silly. Uh, and if you've been down to uh, the Kennedy Space Center at the Visitor Center, you walk in that building, and I went there, I think for the first time about five, six years ago, I walked in that building, I looked up, and I just couldn't believe what I saw. Um, that thing is so massive, and to think that 
that flew. <laughs> Um, simply remarkable. Those, those engines, you could camp, your family could camp in one of those. They're that big. I mean, it'd be hot, but uh, there's, this is the one uh, sitting at, uh, in Houston. Um, I think they put a building over it because it was starting to uh, be damaged by the weather, but it's truly a, a piece of history. Uh, the specs for this thing are well, I could read this off for you, but uh, suffice it to say, it was simply outrageous. Uh, you know, six and a half, seven million pounds of thrust um, at the first stage. Uh, I've read this several times. Um, to engineers, th this is porn. <laughs> the, the numbers are, are simply outrageous what this thing could do. Um, and since, since those rockets flew, we really haven't done anything like that. Uh, Now, what I take particular interest in is, is that. Um, I don't, I'm not going to build those. I, I should mention, um, on these landers, a Canadian company built those legs. Uh, actually, very close to where the Canadian Space Agency is now, uh, in, in I think Long Gula, Quebec. Um, I don't remember the company's name, but they built those legs. So technically, Canada was the first country on the moon. Um, Americans don't think that's funny. But it's, uh, it is. Um, and that little the rover they had there folded up into a pie-shaped compartment on the lander. Uh, it was a bit of an afterthought, but somebody had the, the vision to do this. And uh, like Jerry Seinfeld says, it's a very manly thing to do. Well, we're on the moon. What should we do? Let's drive around. <laughs> so they, they built that thing. They took it. They drove it. Um, it's, it's related to what we're working on today, but in comparison to what we're doing, it was, it was more like a golf cart. Um, it was disposable. They used it a few times uh, and then left and just, it didn't have to run for days and days on end. It just had to run for hours. Another picture of it. Um, while this was going on, the Russians were busy too and they, did, they put that on the moon. So that's Lunacod, uh, which to me is a more interesting rover. This, this vehicle actually survived on the lunar surface. There was two of them. Um, I think the one lasted eight or nine months, and the other one, uh, maybe half that. But that means that they were surviving the lunar night, which gets really, really cold. But this, this is an eight-wheeled skid steer vehicle, which actually looks a lot like, the configuration is a lot like the vehicles we produce commercially. So I, I have a particular interest in that machine. Um, obviously, it's remote control. Uh, that was a real feat of technology back in the 70s, for them to fly that and using just video cameras to operate that successfully for, for months on end. So what's next in lunar exploration? Um, well, there's a lot more interest now. Now that, there's that now that we believe there's water, there's a lot more interest in going back there and trying to make use of it. Water in itself is not a very expensive thing. I mean, if you were, if you, if you were in a desert, a bottle of water is worth a lot more than if you're um, by Niagara Falls. But the water on the moon, because it's on the moon, could be quite valuable. If we ever want to send people to the moon uh, uh, in a, as sort of an outpost or any sort of long-term habitation, we simply can't afford to bring them all the stuff they need. Being able to manufacture water on the moon would give us, uh, uh, obviously, drinking water, but also oxygen, uh, rocket fuel. We can make hydrogen. Um, and that rocket fuel could also be taken off the lunar surface and used for a long, uh, longer term deep space mission. Uh, so we don't have this high gravity well that is Earth. We can deal with, with the moon. I think it takes about 1% of the energy to leave the moon's, uh, the, moon, the lunar surface compared to Earth. So there's a lot of companies actually looking at this and there's a few other projects, uh, both on the CSA and NASA that are, that are examining this a bit closer. Uh, like I said, ultimately the goal, there's companies that are trying to harvest this and sell it on the open market. Um, and I put a picture there of Calvin trying to sell space water, and then he says here, I think I need to be subsidized. And that's kind of the story of, uh, of the, the space business. Uh, it, the government does need to get involved at first to help get over the, the highly risky part. And uh, I mean, the example there is, you know, we have commercial companies putting satellites in space, whereas 50 years ago that was almost an uh, impossible thought. So if we're going to go back to the moon, the difference this time is that initially, at least, it'll be dominated by robotics. This is, a, this is a, the best way to save huge, huge amounts of money. When you send people up, the, 
the risk, the risk level we can deal with robotics is not acceptable when you have a, a, gr a crew of astronauts. Um, the, you don't need to send life support for robots. Um, there, there's, uh, it's been estimated it's between one and two orders of magnitude cheaper to send robots compared to people. And the rovers that we're going to send, um, they're going to have to evolve a lot and look, they're going to look a lot different than the ones that we sent up in the 70s. The alternative to robots, of course, is, a, is an astronaut with a spade. Now, that's actually not a spade. It just looks like it in the picture. But uh, I thought it was a cute picture. Um, I mentioned that in a presentation once. And that's, Herr Jack, that's Jack Schmidt. And he just happened to be in the crowd. <laughs> he, he wasn't offended. He thought it was amusing. But uh, what are the odds, right? Um, NASA's been looking at lunar rovers. Um, They've evolved their lunar rover design from that four-wheeled uh, golf cart to this 12-wheeled uh, thing. It's, it's a bit of a monstrosity. It weighs about 7,000 kilograms. I believe it's an example of what happens when you give engineers unlimited time and unlimited money. They will get absolutely nothing done. <laughs> so fortunately, we don't have that problem in Canada, right? Um, we have very tight budgets and no time. They also built this thing, which looks like that spider out of Wild Wild West. Um, it is, it's a remarkable piece of machinery, uh, but it's got something like 65 motors on it. And, and the wiring and the computers and everything like that, it's so complex. Again, I don't think there's a big future in that thing ever flying. Uh, so the approach we're taking is the KISS um, principle. We've modified it slightly for this, uh, for this area. We want fewer parts, fewer motors, fewer things to go wrong. Um, and one of the ways we do that is we adopt skid steering like we do in our commercial vehicles. Um, this is the MSL rover. It is actually a, quite a functional rover. It's operating on Mars right now. Um, but you can see the level of complexity associated with that machine. There's, uh, I think, about 16 or 18 uh, motors. Um, there's a lot of wiring. It's actually visible in the picture. Um, it's very, very expensive. That program was in the billions of dollars. And the, right there, that's the first rover we designed. And we're intentionally trying to keep it very, very simple. We started that in 2008. Uh, CSA approached us and asked us if we'd want to participate with uh, another group of companies. So in about, within six weeks, we produced this concept uh, of a, you know, these are four-wheeled rovers with a U-shaped chassis. And we were able to connect them together as well to form an eight-wheeled rover. We uh, gave it a name, the Detachable Articulating Removable Two-Person Habitat Crude Robotic All-Terrain Electric Rover, also known as uh, Darth Crater. And this was a, a habitat that could be removable. Uh, but the more interesting part is that thing. We just kind of modeled that up based on how we thought it would be used. And you can see there's a drill there. The idea is that the drill would drill into the ground, collect a sample, put it in the processor, and figure out what's in it. And uh, it turns out that's very close to what we actually ended up doing. After the CSA saw that, uh, some of the work we had done, they decided to send us to Hawaii uh, to participate in this resolve deployment. This was a NASA program that was doing exactly that, drilling into the ground, collecting a sample, and figuring out how much and where that water is. So at the time, it was mounted to an American rover called Scarab. But it had a lot of ground support equipment, which was too big to put on that rover. So we built a trailer, which we called the uh, Special Projects Off-Road Crater Cart, Spock. Eh? You Star Trek guys, I know that's a Star Trek thing. <laughs> and they, we send one of our commercial vehicles there to drive around and support the, the um, deployment, but also to collect data on, um, on vehicle power and, and things like that. Uh, a quick note about Resolve. I stole this from um, a friend at NASA. This is just a, a summary of what it does. They're, they're basically taking a sample and, and putting it through two processes, both of which heat it up. Um, the first one will boil off the water, and the second one will uh, uh, remove the rest of the, the volatiles. Uh, there's some good information on their website about uh, what's going on there. Um, I'm not going to go through the details here. Um, the rest of that deployment. It was basically me driving around up, up hills trying to measure what we could climb, what we couldn't climb. It was in uh, the train there. I think I have some good pictures. It was very Mars-like. Um, 
a little ways away, it was very lunar-like. So it was a great spot to go and test. Um, the most important thing is that it was natural terrain. It wasn't, it wasn't manufactured by, by uh, you know, setting up rocks here and, and steps there. This is just the way it was formed. So we've got, we've got some old volcanic craters, which look a lot like impact craters. Um, we've got uh, you know, wide open sandy spots that look like a lot of part of the moon as well. Some nice shots there of the Argo sitting in the mountain. I think that one made the company calendar. When we got back, uh, we got a contract to, uh, with some other companies to start building these things. So we evolved them a bit, and we ended up building what's called the Juno Rover. It, it only has uh, uh, two main part numbers, basically the, the chassis, which is a U-shaped chassis, and a drive unit, which provides the mobility. You put them together, and you've got these vehicles. Um, we made it so we could put tracks on it, like, like any good Argo, and uh, different wheel options as well. So we see rubber wheels, and we can see metallic wheels. I'll talk about those in a minute as well. Um, the neat part about this rover was that we were in such a rush to get it built that we had no time to uh, communicate uh, extensively with the people developing the payloads. So we said, well, let's just, let's just make a payload bay that's the whole center of the rover. We passed on these dimensions to our, um, our, our colleagues down at, at NASA or the CSA who's ever building the payload, and it really sped up the process. So the first rover we built, it could, we fit blades to it. There was a, a scoop that would lift up dirt and put it into a processor. Uh, this was a GPR that would measure uh, ground penetrating radar that would tell us if there were large rocks under the, under the sand. And we also carried, for the first time, that, that resolve package from NASA. Um, we needed two rovers to carry it because it was pretty heavy, but this, this was the first time the whole resolve package had been on one uh, unified vehicle. Uh, this was a shot from that same deployment, and you can see at one single deployment we showed up with six rovers. We've got one on the hill there, a couple, three with blades, and then uh, the resolve package. Um, this was a bit of an eye-opener for NASA because they typically would spend 500 thousand to two million dollars on a rover and it's it's babied with people in white lab coats and they go to deployment and there's one of them well here we showed up as uh, Canadians in our coveralls and we had six rovers running around so they uh, they got very interested at that point we did a lot of extreme train testing figure out what this thing can do uh, we're on the side of a crater here and here's another shot you can see we went all the way down here and those are people. It's a, very, it's a very big hill. And if you look closely, you can see a rope. That's kind of what we had to use to get out. It was, it was quite steep. We found a few flaws with the vehicle, a couple weaknesses during that test, which is why we do the testing. So we went back to Canada. We, we got some more contracts to develop this vehicle. Um, initially, the vehicle only cost thirty or $40,000. But by the time we finished uh, with some upgrades, it, it was about double that. Uh, bigger motors, most men would agree more power is better. Um, better transmissions, uh, two-speed transmissions. Um, we added a, a, a bit of kit to make the thing, uh, suspension could pitch up and down, which would allow us to basically climb steeper slopes. Um, at the end of that project, we started another one to develop the next generation rover, uh, which was lighter and more agile. Um, and a little more space-like. Um, this was another NASA slide. It's showing a, a picture of our, what we call Artemis Junior rover, with the uh, resolve package installed. By this time, they had shrunk the resolve package down to a single payload that would fit on one rover. Um, so our rover was designed for that payload and vice versa. Um, I'll skip a few of these, I'll run through a few of these pretty quickly. The chassis was similar, I mean it was lighter, but the neat part is it was still that open U-shape. So when we got to Hawaii, we shipped the rover and NASA shipped the payload and we basically installed it with a forklift. You drive it on, drop it on, plug it in. It took a little longer than that, but... The, um, the drive system was, again, designed and built in-house. Uh, we, we made good use of our gear plant. Uh, so we would never, we usually don't buy gearboxes, we just make them. And in this case, we made a gearbox that was the exact shape of this suspension piece that we wanted. So it was a very, uh, uh, fairly lightweight design, but very strong. And we also, we also uh, put a, two speeds on it. So 
When you're doing uh, lunar simulations, you go about 10 centimeters per second, but at the end of the day, you want to put that thing in the tent and go have beer, because it's really, really hot and you're dry. And, and so we gave it the capability to go uh, 100 centimeters per second just to get that thing out of the analog train and into the tent. Um, the alternative is that you have to basically lift the whole rover up with a forklift or something and carry it inside, and that's a bit of a, a burdensome thing. Um, some pretty pictures of gears. You either like gears or you don't. I like them. Uh, suspension, we again put that suspension on, and this time we, we built it into the chassis to keep it protected from dust. Um, it was kind of a neat feature. We don't, we don't use it all the time, but uh, it allows you to drive. Uh, when you leave the lander, you can have a very steep ramp because we can lean the rover back. The ramp will be something like 30 kilograms lighter just because we have that feature. Some pretty pictures. Um, the other thing we started working on was traction elements. Uh, we, we knew, we realized very early on that rubber tires are not going to survive the lunar environment. So there's too much vacuum, um, it's too hot and then it's too cold. The rubber would break down within, uh, they think, one or two weeks. You'd, you'd have nothing left. So we started working on metallic uh, alternatives. The first thing we tried was a track. Um, actually, I'll just a little a bit of an explanation here. It sounds so easy, let's just make a wheel, right? <laughs> uh, what we found is that a rigid wheel uh, doesn't always provide enough traction or enough reliability to survive. And if you've been following the Mars, the Mars rover, um, this is a picture of the MER, uh, Spirit or Opportunity, I forget which one. It drove into a fairly benign looking uh, plane with a bit of s drifting of the sand and just about got stuck. And it took a few weeks for them to get it out of there um, and basically save that mission. If they were unable to back out of there, that, that rover would be pretty well dead. I mean, it'd be immobile. <coughs> and then this is a picture from the current rover, the MSL, the big one. And this picture is a year old. Um, and the wheels are actually uh, breaking badly. Uh, those holes have gotten quite a bit bigger. Um, they actually had to change the, the mission <laughs> to accommodate these, these damaged wheels. And they had to avoid uh, rocky areas and go into the sand just to avoid those, uh, to prevent those wheels from further getting damaged. So we started making a track. We got a little bit of funding from, uh, I think, the provincial government. Um, so lots of pieces and Lots of, we strung them all together and we put it on the rover and it just didn't work at all. Um, so, so we tried it again. Um, this time we used a lot more titanium and kept it pretty light. Um, we built our own, our own hubs for this one. And in the end we ended up with a uh, track system that proved to be pretty functional. So CSA liked it and uh, gave us a contract to build a full set for one of their rovers. We gave it a cool name. The, Tandem tooth wheel, well, you can read it, but we call them Twax. Um, and they have a set right now on one of their rovers, and they've been using it for about three years now without any failures. So that's making us happy. Unfortunately, they were quite heavy. Uh, they weighed twice as much as the next competitive wheel. So we, we had to go back to the drawing board. Um, we did a lot of torture testing to these. Uh, we're big believers in getting out of the lab and going and beating on this stuff. Uh, so these are, these are very serious tests, but turns out when the CSA got a hold of this stuff, they were doing the exact same thing, finding rocks and just going back and forth, back and forth, trying to break it, I think. Um, you know, we, try, we had to figure out what happens when, when a rock gets in there. So we put a rock in. And I think it just kind of crunches it and spits it out. Um, the last test we did, we want to see what happens when it just loads up with uh, gravel. Uh, sand usually just falls through the track, but gravel presented a bit of an issue. So we just shoveled it in until it was admittedly a little bit ridiculous. Just kick it in there. There we go. And then we're going to see if, what happens when you drive away. So our tensioner moves a bit, and the gravel starts going around and around, and then kind of gets spit out. So we did that test a few times, and it convinced us that the track was going to hold together. Um, we, we turned our attention to wheels. Some of the things we learned with the tracks, we realized we could put them into wheels. 
Uh, the wheels are lighter, they're simpler, there's fewer parts. Um, the trick is to make them operate both sand and rocks. If it's, you need traction, but if you get traction at the, at the cost of uh, reliability, then, then you've, got, you've got nothing. If you remember from the Mars pictures, um, they had to face both of those. They had rocks they had to traverse without getting damaged, but they also had sand they had to get over. So we paid close attention to that. Oh, we gave it another cool name, Titanium Interlaced Rim, enabling lunar exploration surface systems, tireless, because there's no tire on it. Thank you. Oh, shoot, what happened? The, um, before we sent these to Hawaii, we had to put them through a thorough test. Um, this is a, a vehicle at full payload, driving over what is pretty ridiculous rocks. Uh, the noise this thing makes is awful, but uh, it had to be done. Um, so we went back to Hawaii. Uh, I don't know why we kept, kept ending, up, ending up there. It sounded like a, I know it sounds like a real nice trip to do a uh, field trip, but the hours were very long. Uh, Peter can attest to that on the other end of the table. Uh, for the first 10 days, we did not see any palm trees because by the, we left at 4 in the morning from the hotel and we get back at 8 o'clock at night. So it was dark the whole time we were in our hotels. Um, we have ended up getting a day off later. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, in July 2012, we went back with a, a f to do a full end-to-end -end demonstration with Resolve. We had our wheels on it, we had the rover, we had NASA participating, providing the, the payload. Um, quick picture of that thing. That's the rover without the payload. So that's how we shipped it, and that's with the payload installed. So you can see we're just working in tents there. Um, it's very hot in the day, it's very cold at night, it's very dry, it's windy, it's dusty. Uh, it's not very nice. Um, and this was another rover that NASA was thinking about using, but the payload had to mount a cantilevered at the front, and that rover ended up not being strong enough, even though it was a very big rover. And it kind of highlights the advantage of putting the payload right in the middle. So a couple shots from that test, uh, it went very well. Um, we, uh, both NASA and the CSA are very happy with the work that uh, everyone had done. Um, this rover was controlled from Montreal, from JSC, and from uh, NASA Ames. So the, the communication system was uh, another thing we were trying out. At the same time, we took another rover with another set of wheels, and we took it up higher into the mountains at about 11, 12,000 feet. Uh, and we participated with NASA. I think I have a video of this. <coughs> yeah, so this was a program at NASA where they just wanted to uh, get a rover and, and drive around and try to figure out um, the, the, the geology of the area using only the cameras on there. So there were some scientists at a remote location and they could only see what the cameras saw. Um, and about two months before this demonstration was supposed to take place, the rover that they had lined up they were told they didn't have access to it. So in a panic, the one guy calls us up and says, can you help us? So we managed to integrate all their equipment in about six weeks onto the rover. We shipped it down there. We did this uh, glorious demonstration. We collected so much data from this. And we were actually able to run the rover for, um, I think we did about 25 kilometers in that, uh, in that week. So it was, a, it was a marvelous test. At the front of the machine is uh, Moss Bauer. That thing alone was about $250,000. Um, so I was encouraged not to bump into any rocks. Um, it says they're 23 kilometers. Uh, we, tr we tried a, a couple different wheels. You can see the, uh, what the surface of the ground uh, was like. Very rocky, very abrasive. Uh, we were fortunate to get through this without any uh, failures. We had what we called a couple NDEs, or near-death experiences, trying to get through a ravine with a, you know, on the rocks with a heavy rover. Um, this, in, in this clip, we actually chipped one of the wheels, and that was the only damage we sustained. So we were, uh, again, pretty happy with that. Lots of data collected. We, we mapped everything out. We collected uh, power profiles. And what we found, we were able to actually put together some, some graphs showing that even changing the wheels would dramatically affect your mission. The one set of wheels used uh, half the power that the other set of wheels did. Well, that has a direct effect on your battery size and your solar panels. Uh, stuff you don't necessarily think about, but it, it proved to be a very viable test. We'll skip that one there. Um, so, we'll skip that. We did another rover that was basically the same type of rover, the same bits, but twice as big. An eight-wheeler called Artemis Senior. This is a big one. It has a kind of a neat suspension which allows it to go over almost anything. 
we uh, sub we we uh, delivered that to CSA in I think 2012. Um, I sped this video up. It's not quite that fast, uh, but we're demonstrating to them that there's not a whole lot in the rock yard that could slow this thing down. So the suspension proved to be highly effective. Um, this, this wall here was renamed Artemis Wall after we did this demonstration. So a very, uh, very fun test. The outlook at this time, well, in 2012, we, we ran across a letter where NASA HQ asked CSA to commit to a program um, in which Artemis Jr. would fly. Well, that, that appears to be a good bit of news. Uh, in 2013, CSA funds a couple studies and then nothing, silence. <laughs> uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on. We weren't, you know, CSA wouldn't commit to that program so that we were kind of stuck. Um, so later on that year, we kind of got bored of waiting and we worked on a commercial version of our rover called the J5. And that's a picture of it. <coughs> I'll show you a couple of clips of that as well. And in, in 2014, we we're so very, very busy, and then they come out with several rover-related RFPs. So all of a sudden, they, there's an interest in these rovers again. So we bid on these RFPs, uh, and we ended up with uh, three contracts. Working on our wheels, we we're doing what's called LRDPD, PD, whatever, um, which was a TRL-6 drivetrain, um, and then a smaller rover project as well. And the NASA project, was renamed Resource Prospect Emission and, and it continues to plug away uh, towards actually getting funding. The, uh, that's a picture of the small rover we're developing for the CSA. And the, the uh, meeting we were uh, at the CSA yesterday for was for this larger rover. Um, it's, it's a fairly, uh, very lightweight, uh, high performance rover that's uh, very lunar-like, uh, very flight-like compared to some of the other things we've done. Um, we will be doing vacuum testing with this one, uh, dust testing with uh, a lunar regolith simulant, as well as thermal testing, which we all need, which we need to do these steps to get to TRL-6. Uh, the mass of this thing is less, it's less than half of anything else we've done before, so it's a big step for us. Um, we've given it a name, the Lunar Rover Drivetrain Vacuum and Dust Related, uh, Lord Vader. Sorry, Star Trek fans. I know that's Star Wars. Uh, the the J5 that we are developing, um, that that's a kind of came out of nowhere. We had a military group approach us and say, "We really like your lunar rover. Could you do a military version?" So of course we got a bit of funding for that and uh, and started working on it. And we developed a very uh, modular platform, very rugged, uh, much much lower cost to produce than the lunar versions. Um, we we made it compatible with all of our uh, lunar stuff so we could continue to test wheels on it. Uh, this is a demonstration at CSA where we brought we brought a few of the J5s and uh, some of the other rovers. Uh, it is very weatherproof, it's very rugged, um, it's it's reasonably lightweight and it can carry its own weight in, in payload, uh, about 20 kilometers an hour, faster than you can run, so this one can actually get away on you. Uh, it's, it can travel over pretty rough terrain. Um, one of the neat features on this one is that it's, uh, uh, it is amphibious. There you go. Uh, some Japanese people dared me to do that. And so I did it and then they bought three. So it was a good move. Uh, this one is, can be operated just line of sight or with a tele-op package that we offer. Uh, you know, you get a laptop and you see what the rover sees. Up to about one or two kilometers away in some cases. Lots of applications for this. The military group has been using it for uh, to carry uh, soldier supplies. Uh, we're also working on some airport applications to move packages around and some agricultural uh, applications where we spray bananas. And so we have a guy down there doing a <coughs> demo doing a demo tomorrow. Uh, in this application, they, there's been some regulatory changes that does not allow aircraft to spray bananas anymore. So they were using ATVs, but the train is too steep and the ATVs were flipping over and people were getting hurt. And then the company that makes the chemicals said, you can't use people, the chemical's too poisonous. So it's a perfect storm uh, that's kind of heading uh, towards this robotic solution. So uh, it looks pretty promising. So we're watching that with keen interest. 
that's about the end of it. If you have any questions, you can ask me or just we can enjoy the snowmobot, as we call it. Uh, this was a J5 we put a track kit on and tried out in the snow because this year that's all we had <coughs> is snow. Does this one also show any skiing or is this just the terrain? Okay. Anyway. So yes, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer any. Yes. The Apollo astronauts complained about uh, lunar dust sticking to their um, spacesuits. I don't know if it was static that electricity. Um, can that be simulated, and how would it affect the rover? Dust is one of the major uh, issues with these rover designs. That's why we're going to actually do dust testing. So we've we've taken uh, in our newest rover design. We need to address that. Um, there's, it, it's sticky, there's an electrostatic phenomenon that uh, kind of moves it around. Um, all of our, <coughs> all, of our <coughs> all of our electronics and motors are in enclosed boxes um, and we use very, very few moving parts outside the rover. So there's, uh, we only use four wheels, there's only four axles, we have special dust shields at those locations to prevent the dust from causing a problem. Uh, the dust can stick to radiators and, and solar panels and stuff like that, so um, our radiators will be vertical, so gravity will help clean off those. Uh, there will be a, some, some dust accumulate, but it, as long as it doesn't degrade the radiator too much, we should be okay. Is, is there any way to clean that dust? Uh, dust to jam up. Uh, there's been some research into an electrostatic process that will eventually, uh, essentially just march the dust right off by sending um, lines of electrostatic, and well, it's kind of hard to explain, but the dust kind of, they turn it on, it goes, it goes and the dust kind of walks off. So there's some of that research going on right now. They also said that it was not <coughs> racist, so the lunar <coughs> Yeah, it's formed, the, the nature of lunar regoliths is formed by impact. So it's a shattering process, but not followed by any weathering. So yes, we have a similar process on Earth when, when Earth is bombarded with meteorites and asteroids, but we don't have as many of those impacts. And, and once they happen, uh, a weathering process takes place and the, uh, you know, a, a, a grain of sand is quite smooth almost. A regolith is very jagged, so it sticks together. It's got a very high angle of repose. Uh, it, it's it's also a very hard material, so it it can stick to things, and then it's also very hard and it's very sharp. So it's something um, that's that you know all lunar rover designs have to take that in consideration. So, so is there a, is there a simulator software? There are probably over half a dozen of uh, well well known uh, lunar simulants lunar regular simulants. Each of them is better at simulating certain things. We've done uh, traction tests at NASA Glenn where they use what's called GRC-1, is what they call it, and it's a good, it's a good mechanical simulant. There's other simulants which uh, more better replicate the, the mineral properties of it, uh, or the electrical properties, or the thermal properties. Um, so NASA has a few, um, CSA has a few. Peter, do you want to go bring up a pail? We have some in the truck. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> Kenobi, <laughs> I don't know, somebody in Sudbury uh, came up with a simulant, mm -hmm. so we're going to be using that for some of our uh, bearing tests. So. Thank you. Yeah. No, no they, they come in fast, they come in hard. <laughs> Try to avoid them. Uh, obviously, <laughs> micro. Uh, if it's small, the, the micrometeorites, we should be, we should, we should be okay. Um, but it's true. Uh, <coughs> as they get bigger and bigger, the, the frequency is much, much less. So it's not really something that's a huge risk. But of course, with space station and everything, that's the same. You know, uh, they, they face that risk as well. Um, and it doesn't seem to be too big of an issue. Although I saw a documentary where. Uh, some debris hit, no, that was gravity. That's different. <laughs> that was quite a mess. So as long as that doesn't happen. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Um, when you're doing your, your tests and, and uh, uh, you're, you're doing like an extreme surface test and you're trying various different uh, 
uh, various different services. Uh, if it does, like, if you get adapted and you're using these, uh, like, for, for measurements, do you include, like, uh, objects for measurement? Like, would you attach those to your, or, or, like, are they so streamlined now that that would make no difference to its durability? Uh. I'm not sure I entirely follow your question. So, like, if, if this is being used, say, on, on, on Mars and it's measuring surfaces, is all of that already contained within, within your vehicle, or would that have to be added on top of the vehicle, like the various tools used for measurement? If, yep. Do you, do you include those in your tests for durability? Sure. The, the part that we're largely responsible for is m mechanical mobility, right? So, all the mechanical bits, motors, controllers, batteries and that kind of <clears throat> when it comes to sensor packs I think that's what you're referring to um, <clears throat> like payloads like the arm and the drill um, <clears throat> those components will be tested separately okay. um, to do an all-up test in a lunar environment is almost impossible because you need a, a large vacuum chamber um, so even when we test in a vacuum chamber we can only test um, about a quarter of the rover at a time so we'll test some components and then some other components uh, it's, it's quite tricky but Yes? Do you have any information on the status of the resolve project? Um, I don't know if anyone does, uh, but we hear rumors. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, it seems to be plugging away. There's, there's, uh, when I go to conferences, I see lots of papers by the guys at, at uh, KSC, at Ames, um, and even at uh, Glenn Research. So there's, there's still a lot of interest in it. It's well understood from the Global Exploration Roadmap that, that, the, that Canada and Europe and um, America put out that the moon is a stepping stone to almost everything we do in space, right? If you want us to do anything on Mars, um, you need to use the moon, both to produce water and fuel or even just for learning how to do things. Um, it, it seems a bit ridiculous to have people, to say we're going to have people living on Mars when we've never lived on the moon before, right? I mean, we visited, but we've never stayed there. Um, otherwise, we're just sending Martian astronauts to their, to their death. So. Okay. okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all.